I like to think of your silence as the love letters you will not write me, as two sax solos from two ages across a stage, learning the languages of kissing with your eyes closed. I like to think of you as a god, to whom I no longer pray, as a god I aspire to. I like the opening of your joined palms, which is like an urn where my ashes find a home, the music of your lashes the silent way your body wears out mine. Mostly, I like to think of you at night, when a black screen of shining dust shines from your minds to the edge of my skin, where you are a lamp of flutters. I remember the spectral lashes, marigold, tamarind, secret thing between your thighs, of closed kissing eyes. At night, the possibility of you is a heavy sculpture of heavy bronze at the side of my bed, a god, and I pray you into life, into flesh. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, the podcast taking a closer look at poetry. How many feelings go through us when we're missing the ones we love? How does that shape our perception of them? This week's poem, A Bronze God or A Letter on Demand by Clifton Gajagua goes some way to answering those questions. It is a poem of memory and longing, one that is unafraid to address the desire of love in all its forms. Clifton Gajagua is a Kenyan-born poet who consistently writes on the themes of intimacy and change, both of which are neatly encompassed in this poem. That idea of change is present even in the title, A Bronze God or A Letter on Demand. It is two options, asking us to make a decision. It is stuck in change as it's being read. This poem comes from Gajagua's 2014 collection, the Madman a Khalifi. It is a series of poems that places the poet and the reader at the center of Nairobi, which in Gajagua's world acts as a microcosm of Kenya as a whole. It is almost a document of Nairobi's change into the 21st century, each poem written in the midst of the shifting and changing landscape as it becomes a modern city. Gajagua often places his poem speakers as a traveller of sorts, observing such shifts. These speakers seem to be constantly on a journey to the next point. They are trapped on some kind of liminal quest. In the foreword to the Madman at Khalifi, Kwame Davis writes in great praise of Gajagua's poetry. The Kenya of Clifton Gajagua is cosmopolitan. It is a world of cyber communication, of cultures intersecting with each other of existentialist angst, of faiths, of multiple languages, of a swirl of ideas and anxieties, of political intrigue and boredom. It is a world of youthful abandon, of passion, of sexual ambivalence, of willful ambiguity. In many ways, what we find in Gajagua is a poet's articulation of the complexities of traditional culture and ultra-modern realities that exist sometimes comfortably with each other, and at times in deep conflict on the continent of Africa. That line on the complexities of traditional culture and ultra-modern realities is a wonderful way to approach this poem. The object of the speaker's affection is all at once a divine being worthy of prayer, a construct of the old world. Yet at the same time, they are engaged in a modern jazz solo, at two different points in time. Just like his view of Nairobi, Gajagua harnesses the contradiction of old and new to create a morphing, fluctuating poem. All his poems fluctuate in this wonderful way. I would argue that Gajagua has written some of the most evocative poetry I've ever read. It's made incredibly clear from the first section. I like to think of your silence as the love letters you will not write me, 
as two sax solos from two ages across the stage, learning the languages of kissing with your eyes closed. The speaker begins in a moment of pure reflection. I like to think of your silence as the love letters you will not write me. It is a striking line which leaves us wondering if the silence is used against the speaker, or is it a comfortable silence that they enjoy. As is typical for Gajagua, there is nothing concrete in these lines. We are left unsure of a few things. Is the speaker's object of desire with them as they contemplate in the dark? Or are they speaking in the absence of that other? Is the person being addressed unwilling to write the speaker love letters? Or are they not doing so simply because it's old fashioned? These moments of silence could be something the speaker enjoys or it could be a torment for them in the absence of their love. Looking at these contradictory images, we can safely assert Clifton Kajagua is a postmodernist. His inclusion of jazz then is very fitting. The two sax solos are born of the same thing, but come in radically different forms, given that time has passed between them, much like this speaker and their other. They are the same, but communicating in different ways. This could be a reference to the way in which some jazz musicians riff on previous players' songs, often interpreting them in their own way, putting their own spin on things. I think it is a beautiful metaphor for love where we learn from the object of our affection, where desire informs our own growth, where we take small moments of another and interpret them, making them our own. The next line is our first hint that the poem is a much more present thing than initially assumed, learning the languages of kissing with your eyes closed. There is something of instinct and intimacy in these words, the moment we learn to trust those we are in love with. To allow our bodies to find each other. This poem is all about communication, or rather, the ways we communicate without words. The speaker and the other are together, exploring one another, trusting one another. In the next section, as Kajagua writes, we understand exactly how the speaker feels. I like to think of you as a god, to whom I no longer pray. As a god I aspire to. I like the opening of your joined palms, which is like an urn where my ashes find a home. The music of your lashes, the silent way your body wears out mine. The reverence in these words rings clear as a bell and the speaker makes it obvious how he views his other. They are deified. In the line, to whom I no longer pray, it is clear that something once again has changed in the relationship between the pair. Once the speaker did pray to them, perhaps from a distance, yearning, transforming them almost into an object. Then, as with many faiths, there was very little intimacy between God and acolyte. Rather, their connection was based on worship. Now, though, Things have shifted, the reverence has been eroded by experience and replaced by something better, aspiration. Now the speaker wants to be more like their other. Just like the jazz solo, where one player learns from another, the same thing has happened again. Now the speaker wishes to be their beloved's equal. In a sudden inversion of the God-worshipper paradigm, it is the other who has their hands clasped in prayer. I like the opening of your joined palms, which is like an urn where my ashes find a home. This is a particularly morbid image that seems to come out of nowhere, but this state of being reduced to ashes could be caused by any number of reasons. The speaker may be exhausted and reduced by the stress of their day, finding solace and comfort in the company of the one they love. Far more likely though, given the romantic nature of this poem, is that the speaker is on fire with passion, forever burning for their other. That more passionate reading is lent further credence by the lines that follow. 
There is the micro-observation of the music of your lashes. Our speaker is so close, he can witness them, hear them make their own sound. It is pure intimacy. It is the final line of this section, the silent way your body wears out mine, that leads us to believe this person is burning in the relationship and would not have it any other way. It is a reference to the ultimate intimacy and completely erotic, harking back to the notion of burning to ashes. Their love is a consuming one. The first two sections of the poem define the relationship between the pair, the final two define what happens in the absence of it. It is pure longing. Mostly, I like to think of you at night, when a black screen of shining dust shines from your minds to the edge of my skin, where you are a lamp of flutters. I remember the spectral lashes, marigold, tamarind, secret thing between your thighs, of closed, kissing eyes. These are words of pure want, spilling from a mind that can think of little else. There is something immediately erotically charged in the simple words, mostly, I think of you at night. What follows is an image that I think belongs with the greatest of romantic writings. When a black screen of shining dust shines from your minds to the edge of my skin, where you are a lamp of flutters. This image is abstract in the extreme, but somehow connects right with the core of me. There is something haunting and hopeful all at once in them. That black shining dust could be a literal sand, or glinting beads of sweat clinging gently to the skin. They're longing for each other, calling out across distance. The speaker's reference to their other as a lamp of flutters is particularly beautiful. It invokes moth wings or butterflies, like the ones in their stomach, perhaps. That flutter, like the glimpses and flashes of memory that make up the speaker's idealized love. Their bronze god. Those flutters of memory are then given sharp focus by the senses, and listed off by the speaker. There is a beautiful flow from flutters to lashes, a verb often associated with eyelashes. Scents dominate his memory, marigold and tamarind. Full desire takes over, and intimacy is the one thing we can think of as we read the words secret thing between your thighs. The instinct and trust returns once again in the closed kissing eyes. This is a true proclamation of devotion, one filled with longing and love. It is a testament to Kajagiwa's writing that so many glances and fragments of memory can be wound together in this beautiful thread. He achieves this through his mastery of imagery. Each one is striking and sticks in the mind. He is heavily influenced by the imagists and has been quite candid on their influence in his work. He stated this in an interview in 2017. My early interest with poetry began with the imagists, with Pound. I read some kind of manifesto he'd written. I think because I'm a poet first, I then became interested in movement and images, and economy mostly. Yes, the economy, limited time, that's what poems and films are, in essence. Limited time to say something. That economy Kajagua speaks of is what allows those abstract sensual images to flow so naturally. Before one is done, another is slipping into place. A seamless construction of fragments. This flood of intangibility seems to give way in the final few lines. All those images move from liquid to bronze. At night, the possibility of you is a heavy sculpture of heavy bronze at the side of my bed, a god, and I pray you into life, into flesh.
The words of Kwame Davis once again inform our reading. He spoke of angst and faith. Here they literally intersect in these final lines. As the speaker's longing for the other gives way to materialization. Their worship of their missing love is so strong that the possibility of them begins to take solid form. I love the parallel to the myth of Pygmalion that Kachagua may, consciously or unconsciously, be drawing here. Pygmalion was a sculptor who carved the perfect woman. Then, by praying to the gods, had life breathed into her. For Kajagua's speaker, there is no middleman. His desire and want lead to direct creation. I pray you into life, into flesh. Those final words are a perfect ending point, reaffirming the instinctual, almost erotic want that has coursed throughout the poem. They leave the reader in no doubt that the speaker, to this day, might still lie in the dark, burning for their love. For me, this is a poem that looks at romantic love as a whole. It is not some idealized, almost pastoral form, but rather a very human one. Gajagua finds a wonderful balance between tradition and modernity. The love letters you will not write me are not because the other does not wish to send them, but because the days of love letters are past. Despite that, Kajagua shows us that the deep emotions or devotion that inspired such correspondence are very much alive and present. This beautiful cascade of imagery creates a protagonist on fire, someone who burns for their love in a pure romantic sense of worship, but also craves them in a physical way in the depths of the night. The poem is a living, breathing testament to the ways in which love can make us delirious with wanting, enough to transcend even reason itself. What did you think of the poem? I'd like to point out, as always, that this is my interpretation, and I'd love to hear yours. You can get in touch with me in a few different ways. I'm on Instagram at Words That Burn Podcast and Twitter, at Words That Burn. I'm also now on Mastodon, at Words That Burn, in case you fancy a Twitter alternative. You can find the show notes for this episode on Substack at the link in the description. If you really enjoyed this episode, please consider giving me a review wherever you listen. It helps me out massively. This week's episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music in this week's episode was by Sean Williams and is used under license. You can find a link to their work in the description.